Q. Hello, Mike Daisy. Thanks for having me. Good to see you here in person. Uh, and congratulations on the reaction to this show last night. I was there, and it, I would describe it as rapturous. Oh, I'm glad that you felt that way. I um, No, I was really happy with the reaction. I was really happy with the room. This is an interesting show for you to do and then for you to do here in Canada, in Toronto. You live in New York. Yes. Uh, you wanted to premiere this show here where we've been living with the Rob Ford crack story for just over a year. Why did you want to start here instead of a more neutral setting like, like Chicago or NYC? Because I built it for here. I mean, it's built for these people. It's built for Toronto. I mean, specifically built to be performed for the people of Toronto who've lived inside the context of the story and specifically for people who live uh, as Canadians who um, uh, uh, perhaps have a more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a temperate way of life than the extremes that uh, I feel like Americans are prone to and then have been living with the Rob Ford saga, which is a little bit like having an American, maybe an extreme American, be your mayor. Um, and then go through this this great this this, this incredible scandal, and so um, it was actually specifically built. It had to be done here. I wouldn't have done it anywhere else. You make a lot of distinctions between, from your perspective on Canadians and Americans mm -hmm. uh, throughout your show. And, and one of the conclusions you seem to reach is that you don't believe Rob Ford would still be in office if he was in office somewhere in the United States. Well, of course not, because I mean. I mean, one of the most remarkable oversights in this process, and I've had it explained to me twice by two different people, one of whom is something of a legal scholar, the amazing oversight of not actually having a way to remove him. I mean, I mean that implies a certain respect for the process of shaming. That is, I, I mean, I really can imagine the really bright, smart, sharp, wonderful Canadians sitting together, putting together the municipal rules of how your governance will work, looking at one another, being like, "Well, we're never actually going to need to, you know, like." Anyone would be, any good Canadian would be shamed out of office. I mean, it's not actually necessary to have a way of, you know, to be gauche and then just not having one. I mean, I literally am certain that there is a way in America because so we're, if we're used story to broke out in, in New York, what would happen? Oh, I mean, there would be an incredible scandal, but there would be a way to remove the person. I mean, what's interesting, part of what's interesting about the story is that instead of it being one sided, it's actually a detente. Like uh, the media and the public like to portray it as being uh, one sided and that Rob Ford has been destroyed, but he is not destroyed. He's actually still in office. He's still he is still actually in the eye of the public. He's still being covered. And that's part of what makes it um, sort of an ongoing story is that tension because there's this sense that he should have resigned and a sense that he should have been um annihilated and instead he's awfully present for someone who's been annihilated he's not just covered he's um it's something of a media obsession i mean oh, yes. you you even talk in the show you joke about the fact that there's a lot of stories written now about how many stories are written about rob ford there's yes. this, this meta thing happening where people are and you know we've made this decision it's not a, we're not on some moral high horse but we made this decision on this show that we at some point that we just want to stop talking about it unless there's something really really, really new and revelatory because we're just feeding that same uh, machine. And yet you, having acknowledged that, are also talking about it. And you're also feeding that machine. Tell me about that juxtap juxtaposition or contradiction. Oh, it's a really simple one. I mean, I, I actually, you can't say it about yourself, but I'll, I'll put you on a high horse. I think that's a fantastic decision you made, especially given the platform and the way that you guys do stories here. I think it's fantastic that you made that decision. For me, um, I'm an artist. And so inherently there actually has not been enough art talking. I mean, one of the reasons the story becomes so thin is that um, I think journalism is an incredible, incisive tool, but often um, it can be misdirected. And one of the problems is that when a story is hot, all the journalism outlets feel compelled to cover the same thing again and again, like an incredibly sharp knife cutting the same piece of cheese over and over and over again. Art functions differently. There are different things a monologue can bring to a story, including uh, making connections about empathy, talking about uh, talking about how journalism affects something. Journalism actually isn't a very good tool for talking about how journalism works because uh, there's too many conflicts. And so um, I came to the story because I wanted actually to try to talk about it in a new way.
And by the way, I should clarify, too. I mean, we're not a daily uh, news show covering the news in the moment. So I, I don't take any way, anything away from journalists who are doing that right. when it comes to Rob Ford. But in terms of a reflective magazine show, we just what's there left to talk about is, is our position. Uh, uh, now, having said that, when you're doing an artistic piece, a theatrical piece like you are, that is very much in the moment. That is to a theater of people who kind of know, who know this story quite intimately. I mean, there's no one more than Torontonians who've been... Uh, who uh, accustomed to the story, uh, you have to be cognizant of what's changing in the moment around the story because it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. And so your show, I know you don't work off a script, which is quite remarkable because you delivered almost a two-hour monologue last night without looking at any notes. Your show has to be a morphing organism itself. There was news that came out yesterday about the Ford Escalade, that, that, yes. or the, that, that his car had been commandeered by a woman and who is, was drunk. And there, there's a story that came out yesterday. You adopted that very quickly into your show. Tell me about being ready to do that. I mean, it's just the act of being uh, ready to, uh, you know, the shows are extemporaneous. They're woven in the air in front of the audience as they're occurring. So um, there isn't an existing structure to upend. The outline, the notes that I work from are all written in the final half hour before we start. You have no roadmap. No, I mean, I have, it's in my mind. But you came to Toronto and you do a three nights of a show and you, don't, you didn't know where you were going with the show necessarily? That's correct. That's correct. That puts a lot of pressure on you, doesn't it? It does, but it's an interesting thing. I mean, it would seem like um, a crazy feat, but the truth is, and you saw the show last night, so you, you understand, you'll understand this. Um, just like our interview here, you are working with some notes, but you're working extemporaneously. You are looking at your notes, and then you're asking me questions, and you're right. improvising the moment. I am not working. We didn't memorize the script of this conversation yes, before right. we started. Um, it's a human process for how we create synthesis in speaking, and the way that the monologues work, um, they work with that. They work with storytelling, the native bones of it that are hardwired into consciousness. And I um, am not as good as my subconscious. And so what I do is I try to research things and feed my subconscious. And then when I'm speaking in the monologue, my subconscious is doing the heavy lifting of making a lot of the connective parts. There are overarching things I'm making. There's a, a cooperation between my conscious effort. But the truth, the truth is that like uh, where it's really good, I'm not actually fully responsible or the conscious part of me isn't. Um, do you uh, ever have a moment before a show somewhere in the world where you're about to do this where you go, oh, my God, what if I suck tonight? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I believe I had a couple of those moments yesterday. So you, so and because there's no safety net. When no, there is not. You're, you're going out there, and and in this case, you know, you're you never even been to Toronto before. Right? That's correct. So the, there really was no safety net, you're, and and yet you you seem to nail it again in terms of the audience reaction. Uh, you're interested in how the media has framed Rob Ford in terms and framed the story, particularly particularly because it is, is a story that really doesn't change. What does the Rob Ford story reveal about the media to you? Oh, I mean, it's just a great object example of something that. I mean, should actually be, as a media literate society, everyone should understand in their bones, which is that all stories struggle. Like, there are no stories that exist in an objective vacuum of objective media, that every single story is crafted by the people who are telling you the story, and even just the choices about which stories are the story and which stories go by the wayside, uh, the process of endless omission that goes into any editing process, and that uh, a remarkable number of people in our culture, uh, don't think about that in a deep way uh, because it gets it's a lot harder to get through life if you're constantly thinking about the frame of things. Um, but if you do think about the frame of things, it's really the only ethical way to try to get through life and have a sense of um, the forces at play. And so for me, I feel like the story of Rob Ford is like a really great example because there is so little to talk about. It's like if you see an engine churning, the journalism engine, and there's no gas going to the tank, there's nothing you coming in, you can really see it. You can also see it, for instance, in a different way with the, um, the lost airplane earlier this year when they lost the airplane and uh, no one knew where it was. And for a while there were new revelations, but then they kind of ran out of revelations. But I mean, it's a whole airplane. And there were so many people, so it must still be newsworthy, and people are still searching. Sure. And so if you'd watch, like, uh, in this case, it was more of a cable news problem than a, than a print journalism yes. problem. You could watch them, 
like watch their engine running with nothing going into it. And it gives you a sense of what the frame is because when there's no content, you focus on the picture frame. But isn't it, isn't it sort of the opposite? I mean, in this case, there is actually a lot of content. Um, uh, there's a mayor saying things that some people find offensive. There's a mayor retracting things or, or lying, which, as you pointed out, we all do last night. But, but, uh, but you know, he is the mayor of the largest city in Canada. And uh, right. uh, there's a mayor who, who empirically now says, I did crack. So, I mean, these are things, this isn't a, the, the mystery of where did the plane go. These are, no, no, these are there are some facts that are uh, not subjective. Is that possible? Well, I mean, the thing is, the, uh, like, facts are not subjective. But the question is, who is telling you this fact? How are they framing it? What fact are they describing? Uh, this is like basic media literacy. Like, it's very important to understand that. And to understand that basic media literacy is very good for the media, but the media sometimes has a tendency to not actually enjoy media literacy because it's sometimes more enjoyable to simply say, I have the news. It is objective, of course. Trust me completely and fully that I always tell you exactly what is what, and I will tell it to you. And so there's a there's sort of a push and pull about how much power we give the people who um, are the arbiters of our news experience. Um, I, but it, I do agree that like the Ford situation, has a sort of evolving mosaic. And that's part of what makes it so difficult to for journalists to put down because there is always something happening. The problem is, does it have probative value? Like, is it actually that interesting when Rob Ford says something else? But the problem is he is the mayor of this huge city, but he has no power, but he's still officially the mayor. So you're really trapped because you have to keep reporting on him, even if what he's saying really feels like now might just be setting himself up for a transition to reality TV. Did you feel like you could add to this story? Add to the story? Did you feel like you could bring something new to this story? Oh, I see. I think that's like a that's probably a, a traditional journalism frame about that. Like I, I thought I could tell a story right. that would um, illuminate things about about the human condition, which is why I make I make most art. So I guess the answer is yes, but I, I didn't actually think of it in terms of like adding to the story because I don't see my work as additive to a pile in which other journalists are in a scrum. Well, one of the things you've said is one. Uh, you said one of the things that is never talked about is how much Rob Ford, uh, being a large man, affects everything about how he's contextualized. Uh, tell me about that. Do you think Rob Ford's size and his battle with weight has been made into something? symbolic of his character in a way that his crack smoking hasn't? Well, of course. I mean, it, uh, you, my experience, uh, we're on the radio in some of the context that this program is happening, so people might not know I am, in fact, a large person. And, um, yeah, it informs everything about your life in every possible way. Like, it frames everything that happens. It's a huge factor. It's also one of the areas um, in our lives where um, if you're in a Western cultural context, which you are in the very polite city of Toronto and the very nice continent of North America, where um, straight up bigotry is completely, totally accepted because we have a, a cultural context where we tie all weight to willpower. So there's a, there's a connection made really quickly between like character and weight like instantly. Um, and then there's also a fear of being fat. So people uh, lash out often, uh, really often. And you can just see that in the coverage. You can, it's very easy to see. Uh, there's a couple of ways that you seem, I mean, there's, do you empathize in some ways with Rob Ford? Well, I empathize with all my subjects. I mean, I empathized with Steve Jobs and uh, when, I, when I worked on a piece about him and honestly, not well, a terribly wonderful person i mean like you so, saw but I, I i i i'm fascinated by people who are um i'm fascinated by the complexities of people and i'm, I'm i find rob ford um in some ways repellent the things i know about him but i also know um i also know that so i know so little of his interior life i'm really struck by that how much we know about his bluster and his public persona but i don't actually feel like i know him very well at all I mentioned in your in your introduction, uh, like the introduction to having you on the show, you you came to public attention for this one man show, the agony and ecstasy of Steve Jobs, and you told the story on this American Life, and and then in an interview two months later, host Ira Glass called you out on all the, all these discrepancies, every discrepancy, in fact, in your account. At one point in this new show, Mike, you share your own understanding at the public humiliation and, and hate directed toward Rob Ford, and you you talk about how you've experienced that. Tell me a bit about that. Um, I'm trying to remember which, 
there are many different things that happen sh in the show. Sharing so I'm not sure. an understanding of um, being at the center of a scandal oh, and, yes. and, and yeah. the humiliation that you have been through and how that might um, carve a path to empathy for Rob Ford for you. Yes. I, 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 oh, I understand now. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Like, um, uh, that's really true. Like, I think that the process of a scandal is uh, similar, uh, regardless of what the actions are that have triggered it. And so uh, the feeling of the um, the feeling of the fury and uh, sort of unalloyed anger of the public uh, coming at you um, and the proportionality of it is people you've never met and will never meet are furious with you furious and um they feel very free to express that hate and um i uh yeah it does it does make me have have empathy for him i mean i've had friends who have had um have had drug problems and and like in many ways uh i understand that it's unbelievably frustrating to be trapped in the situation with someone who seems so incapable of helping themselves so i think the anger of people in toronto is very makes a lot of sense but at the same time uh, it really feels like the narrative of, you know, someone with a real serious problem. So I often wonder about the lack of empathy and what that does in terms of, um, in, in just in terms of the public narrative, in terms of his ability to actually get help. And he's responsible for his own actions, but like, I just I, I feel like uh, I feel like there's a lack of empathy considering the situation. I don't know if this comes out of the the, the scandal that you've been through. Uh, um, and uh, the discrepancies that were in your account and that famous uh, retraction episode with with uh, Ira Glass. But it did, if there was a subtext last night in terms of where you were directing anger at times, it was towards journalists. You, you don't... <laughs> You don't seem to have a lot of good things to say about about oh. journalists. Are you angry at journalists? Oh, I um, oh, I, I, I like journalists very much. I have a lot of friends who are journalists still. Uh, I like journalism and journalists very much. That said, you know, it's a difficult thing to become the subject and object of a story. It's a very difficult thing. I actually said at one point last night, I talked about how valuable it is to be the interviewee and how people who yes. interview all the time should be compelled to do. And I think I gave a high, what sounded like a high number. I think I said 60 or 80 and people laughed. But I mean, I was actually speaking the truth. I myself have done hundreds, probably thousands of interviews at this point. And it's a really valuable thing to understand that when you are the interview subject, you are the meat for someone's dinner. Like you are being interviewed and then you are becoming their art. You're becoming their story that they're weaving. And then often, especially in print journalism, they will shape your words. They will choose what has happened. That is, you know, they choose and edit and shape a narrative. And um, it's it takes a lot of trust to give that power over. Um, and it can be difficult. Um, it can be really difficult after you go through an experience, kind of like the experience that I went through. Having said that, um, the main reason I talk about it is because having gone through the experience, I really think a lot about this idea of the objective worldview and uh, namely the idea we often seem to have in the West that there is, uh, that was on the news, so we know it's true, so that's how things are, and we know it's all right because we saw it on the news. And it's like very important that people understand that the world is complicated and we have multiple paths to everything. And so, I mean, if anything, I, I feel like I feel like my role in some ways is to, at least in this particular piece, was to kind of talk about the journalists as players in the Rob Ford scandal. So like any like any piece of storytelling, like the appearance of like how upset I am with them may be heightened for the purpose of framing the story. But in my day-to-day -day life, I, uh, I'm i still talking to lots of journalists. <laughs> and right now, well. Uh, yes, and right you, now. You do, you're doing interviews, even though you say you don't like doing interviews. No, no, I mean, I actually really enjoy the jousting and the back and forth and the shaping of the interview. I enjoy it a great deal. But um, but it really is like, um, it's like, you know, um, it's like having sex with someone and, and they're on top. So it's just a little, you know, it's just a little challenging sometimes if uh, you're getting not, my head around that. Right I am now, just yeah. on a natural bottom is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, um, the... The show builds towards something of a crescendo, your, your new show, where you 
um, tell the audience that you, you decided in a in a in a real way of trying to understand this story to do crack when you came to Toronto uh, over the last few days. Tell, why did it feel necessary for the sake of of this show for you to do that? To to do crack. Well, I mean, it should be said that that now now no one needs to see the show because we have we have spoiled <laughs> we have spoiled my entire third act, I, my entire shaping of my. I, I was aware that art. it might be a spoiler alert, but I also you have now destroyed the artistic shape of the. Um, but hopefully, you know, hopefully, I'll do my best. To my recover. sense is that it'll shape it'll shape shift itself each night. Your show, uh, it seems given that it's unscripted, so I haven't spoiled. Right, anything. right, no, no, it's very true. It's very true. Although I don't have a lot of time, you know, before tonight's show. So, like, I don't have time to seek out an entirely other drug. I don't have time to, like, coach a, coach a, uh, you know, a, a team or do other Rob Forty. And th- I don't have time between now and showtime to, to actually uh, to, 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 to change my whole life to do those things. Um, well, you know, like, like a lot of the monologues, um, I feel like it's my job to, uh, to look for things that are not being addressed uh, in our culture in a conventional way. Like, it's my job to actually... Um, look for the holes and the gaps and the fissures and then try to fill that gap. Um, so that's, that's what I do in, in all my work, you know, and like sometimes it involves, uh, things that are provocative and sometimes it involves things that are incredibly mundane. And so do you, like, do you care? I mean, because of the questions raised about your Steve Jobs show on this American life, do you care if people believe or don't believe your crack story? Oh, I mean, I'm not the arbiter of other people's belief. You know, um, I am very interested in um, whether they choose to participate in the um, art of the experience, you know, because, you know, I have a I have a an entire mediated artistic experience that's two hours long that, uh, you know, uh, includes this 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 uh, this point that you're talking about now, but it's shaped and honed and formed into the middle of it. You know, it's built into the structure of it. It has reasons for being there, reasons for the shape of it. So in the context of the performance, do I care whether they believe? I care if they believe in the performance as they're watching it. Okay. I care if they're invested. But uh, outside of that, in this performance, which would be the performance of your interview, in which my piece of my story has now been lifted out and inserted into your interview, do I care if they believe in this interview? Uh, you know, I leave that... I leave that in your I really hands. didn't want to destroy your your art piece. By the way, we, oh, we, we talked that. to your publicist beforehand and said it was okay to out you uh, out the that part of your show. Really, she said that. She did. That's a terrible decision. <laughs> that is a oh, terrible decision okay. of hers. Uh, Mike, thank you for this. <laughs> thank you.